really enjoyed, and I'm, I dare speak on behalf of many of us, I really enjoyed the way they felt relaxed on this stage. They were not scared. That's a good start to become preachers of the word someday if you're not afraid to be in public, if you're not afraid to be on the stage, on the platform. So that's a good start. But anyways, uh, before we go into one of the most beautiful traditional texts in the scripture, which is read and taught and preached at, in every Advent season, let's bow for a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your Son, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to this world to become our Savior, the Redeemer of all our sins. Thank you for your amazing, incredible grace, Lord Jesus. Thank you for coming into the hearts and minds of millions and millions of people across the world. And Lord, thank you for reminding us during this special season of the year that the reason why you came to this world, to die for our sins, to provide us with a way out, with a way, of, with a way of salvation, to set us free from the bondage of darkness and the devil and the sin. Lord, thank you for who you are in the lives of so many people. And Lord, as always, we're praying for the salvation of many other people to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what we ask and pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles or your phones in your hands, will you please turn or tap to Gospel of Luke chapter 1, verses 26 uh, to 38. Gospel of Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. The title of this message is just taken right from the scripture. There is nothing impossible for God, the faith of Mary. There is nothing impossible for God. Whenever we think, meditate, pray to God about Creator God, God of the Bible, keep it always in your mind, this statement from our text. For God, there is nothing impossible. If He chooses, He is able to do, to perform any kind of miracle, because He is unlimited in His power and in His strength. Let me remind you of something important about uh, something connected with this nativity story. Even some names of the major characters of Christmas, of the Advent season. First of all, the very name Jesus in the original language, Yeshua, means Jehovah, Yahweh saves. That's the name Jesus received in incarnation. A very prophetic one. Jehovah Yahweh saves. How about John the Baptist? His name literally means uh, Yahweh has been gracious. Yahweh has been gracious. How about the mother of John the Baptist, Elizabeth, or Yeleshava in Hebrew? Her name literally means God is my oath. And how about Mary? exalted one, beloved one. And Zechariah the priest, the father of John the Baptist, Yahweh remembers. So if we bring together all those names and the original Hebrew meanings of those names, it's an incredibly, incredible story of salvation. Yahweh saves, Yahweh has been gracious, God is my oath, exalted one, beloved, Yahweh remembers. In a nutshell, this is the story of Christmas. This morning we're going to study something special about our God and a human response to God's invitation to come to Him in faith. Before we go to our text, and before I read it one more time, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, a little bit of a background. Throughout the nations of the world, there are holidays, right? In any country, there are some statutory or public holidays or days off. Surely the most widely shared commemoration across the world involving more people and more nations so far than any other holiday celebration is Christmas. Although recently I've read that there's some trouble coming because some people and more and more people in our beautiful vast land of Canada are not happy with public celebration of Christmas. Some people are saying that it's discriminatory, the public display of Christmas, the public celebration of Christmas, because not all people in Canada are Christians. It transcends, nevertheless, this Christmas transcends national history and it goes everywhere where Christianity has been preached, taught, and established. 
Though it is the mostly widely celebrated holiday around the world, in many ways it is the least understood. All the holidays and all the celebrations, if you look at the calendar and all the commemorations, they are about people and different historical events across the globe. People, famous people, famous historical events, and they just de are designated to remind us about some important uh, events in human history. Christmas commemorates a divine person, not a human being, and a divine event. We're not remembering what a man has done, but what God has done. The child of Christmas was God in human form, born as a baby, living as a man for 33 years. This story begins in verse uh, 26 in Gospel of Luke chapter 1. Let me read this verse. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. It sounds like a, an announcement a narrative in our Bannon Press, right? Local paper. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to, by, from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. The simple, lovely narrative clearly designed to feature the divine character of the event. There's nothing man-made about this. There's no more wonderful, no more marvelous, no more compelling, no more miraculous story in all of history than this one, as God begins to tell the drama of salvation in the birth of God-man. It is not the first mentioning of the coming Savior in the Scripture, the child that would be born. In fact, you can go all the way back to the third chapter of Genesis, and in Genesis chapter 3, you know, is where the fall of man is recorded, described. Living in the garden of the paradise of God, Adam and Eve, enjoying the full blessing of God in holy innocence, fell into sin. And immediately upon that sin, they were cursed, condemned, and the curse influenced the whole human race. Genesis 3.15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you strike his heel. Here we can see in Genesis 3.15 a promise that a seed will come of the woman. A woman has no seed. Man has a seed. But there will be a woman who will have a seed. She will bear a child who will bruise the serpent's, the devil's head. There is a first prophecy that the Messiah would come, that the seed of the woman would destroy the one who had destroyed the human race by bruising his head. A human offspring of Eve would be born of a seed in a woman and someday deliver the fatal blow to Satan. In the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 18, 15, the prophecy says, Deuteronomy 18, 15. There will be a prophet like no other prophet. The final prophet will come. The ultimate prophet. The two looked forward to the birth, to the coming of Christ. The psalmist writing in Psalm 2, 7 says, God will have a son. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Psalm 2, 8 says, and I will make the nations your inheritance. This son will come to rule the world. Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Wonderful, powerful prophecies were given to Israelite and to the rest of mankind hundreds and hundreds of years before the first coming of the Lord. 
So this is a story of God coming into the world, but it's not the first time we have heard about it. It has been promised. This is a story of its fulfillment. It was planned, just think about it, before creation. It was predicted from the beginning of human history. And here it is. The hope originally awakened in that first promise in Genesis 3.15 and kept alive for thousands of years in the hearts of God's faithful people is about to be realized. And Luke's account emphasizes the divine character of this great event. It's all about God and His mercy to us sinners. Point number one of this message sounds like this. God's message to Mary through angel Gabriel, verses 26 through 33. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. We can see here the divine beginning of this incredible and just amazing story. The verse tells us, verse 26, now in the sixth, sixth month. What is that, the sixth month of the year? Is it about June? No, it's the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And if we go back to verse 24, let's do that in this uh, very chapter, Luke 1, 24. After these days, Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant, and she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, This is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among men. Wow. The promise of God to Zacharias came true. After his duty in the temple was complete, he went home. And it says in verse 23 in Luke 1, after the days of his priestly service were over, he went home. And Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant. She kept herself in seclusion, as we've just read, for five months. And in verse 26, our text, in the sixth month, that's the sixth month of her pregnancy, the angel Gabriel came back within six months. Back in verse 19 of this cha Luke chapter 1, Gabriel is identified as the angel who spoke to Zacharias, the priest. He is a special angel. In fact, you can check this out on your own, dear friends, only two God's angels are named in the Bible, Michael and Gabriel. It says in verse 26, this angel named Gabriel was sent from God. As always, Luke focuses on the divine aspect of the story. The source of the message was God. God sent his angel with a message. This is really the key to the whole story. Luke is recording the truth about the divine action. He comes down out of heaven to a town in Galilee called Nazareth. It was a small place like Nipoa, Minidosa, Gladstone, Roblin, Russell, Swan River, Flinflon, Snow Lake, Thompson, Manitoba. Like in the middle of nowhere. That's what we hear all the time whenever you talk to people from BC, Alberta, Ontario. If you just introduce yourself and your geographic location in Manitoba, Nipoa. They even cannot say it. They say Nipawa often in many cases. So it was a very remote, small village, small community in Galilee. 
It is located for us, readers of this Gospel account, for a special reason. Because if it was not located, non-Palestinians would not have any idea about it. They would ask, where is that? Where is that Nazareth on the map? So it is for that very reason it is mentioned. The angel comes down from the presence of God from heaven, comes down to the region of Galilee, to the little town of Nazareth, to a virgin, engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of King David. And the virgin's name was Mary. This Hebrew name means the exalted one or beloved. The angel comes down and goes to one house, God has chosen one person to become the mother of the Messiah, of the Mashiach, virgin, as the word parthenos in Greek language, in the original Greek, in Hebrew, alma. It means one who has had no sexual relations. That's exactly what it means, one who has no sexual relation. This word is never used of a married woman. According to the Roman law, and uh, Palestine, Israel was a part of the Roman Empire at that time, the minimum age for girls to be engaged and married was, just listen, 12. So if you're 12, if you have some girls <clears throat> in our midst today who are 12, give praises to God that you're living in Canada in 2023, but not in the days of the Roman Empire. For boys, whom we all know, boys develop slower. It was 14. Augustus, the Roman emperor had set the minimum age under his rule at 10. That Augustus was something. That would be an age for engagement. And Jewish practice basically followed that. Girls were usually engaged around 12 or 13 years old and married after the engagement or the betrothal was over. And the reason they did that was because they therefore would guarantee their virginity. As soon as they had reached their puberty, they would be engaged and then soon married. In that way, they did not have to live 5, 10, and 15 more years, who knows how many, trying to restrain their normal adult passions. So here was a girl, I mean a girl, 12 or 13 years old, engaged to a man named Joseph. In those days, it was more than engagement. It is not the same as our engagement today. Betrothal or engagement was a binding legal relationship, and it was arranged by parents or by grandparents as well. And if some relatives live long enough, by great-grandparents. It was a legal document. Parents agreed that their children would marry. And it occurred soon after puberty. Probably was planned for in the community. And there was no sexual relationship during the period of engagement, which usually lasted for a year. The couple did not live together, but only death or divorce could break the contract. After and if the man died, the betrothed girl would be considered a widow. Betrothal, as I said, lasted about a year. And during that year, the girl would prove her faithfulness, but not by not giving herself to anyone else, she would have to prove her purity. And during the same year, the boy, the boy, or it, it could have been an elder, an older man, would prepare a home for her, a place for her, usually with an addition to his father's house. And you can see it in some communities of old order Mennonites in North America and some other communities, they still do that. They keep adding uh, just attachment to the parents' house. At the end of that year, there would be a wedding feast that usually lasted seven days. The kind of thing that Jesus was at in John chapter 2. It is recorded that Jesus was at a wedding. Remember that they ran out, ran out of wine because it lasted so long. At the end of the seven days, the friends of the bridegroom handed him his bride, that was a custom, and everybody left. The newlyweds had fun, I'm sorry, and the marriage was consummated. That was the practice. Well, Mary was engaged. Her husband had paid a ransom 
to her father. That's what we cannot understand living in Canada nowadays, all those customs. The actual wedding was still in the future. Now the young man to whom she was engaged is named Joseph. Now when you get named Joseph, you've got a little pressure because the name Joseph means may he, may he have many sons. She was engaged to Joseph, and very importantly, he was of the descendants of David. He had David's DNA. He was a descendant of the royal line, Messianic line in Israel. He was in the royal line. His bloodline had come right through David. Joseph really was in that line, the great king of Israel. The virgin's name, as we have read, was Mary. This is interesting. That's a Greek word. It's a Greek variant of the Hebrew name Miriam. The Hebrew is Miriam, the Greek is Mary. And she was named well. I don't think her parents had any idea how well they named their baby girl. Mary means exalted one. No more additional information actually is given about Mary, just her name and that she was a virgin engaged to Joseph. Now let's continue our verses, some inf additional information in verses 20, uh, starting with verse 28 at this time. And coming in, he said to her, the angel Gabriel, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. You have found favor with God. Mary was the recipient of God's grace, not the source of God's grace, as many Catholic and Orthodox Christians believe. If you read the Magnificat of Mary, her son of praise in Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 48, Mary needed a savior as anybody else in this world. God has graced you, the angel Gabriel told her. Why? Divine choice. It doesn't say anything she did or anything she did to deserve it. It purposely leaves out any commendation of the girl. Mary was not and is not a source of grace. She's like all the rest of us, a recipient of God's grace. Mary is one of us. The issue here is not Mary's worthiness. The issue here is God's sovereign choice. Mary is great, but she is not God or goddess. She is not an object of worship. Jesus is the object of worship. So the divine messenger Gabriel comes by the divine choice to Mary with a divine blessing, grace, announcing the near birth, the divine child. To this point, she doesn't even know what the message is. All she knows is that God has chosen her to be gracious to her. That was the message from Gabriel. The Lord was with her and the Lord was gracious to her in a special and unique way. But that was because she did belong to him. She was a believer. Mary represented the faithful remnant in Israel as Zechariah, as later on John the Baptist, as Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, the faithful remnant in Israel. Then the announcement uh, comes of the divine child in verses 31 and 32. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be a great, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. That was the message. And uh, in verses, uh, the following verses, in particular 34 to 38, we just can read about Mary's response. That's point number two of this message. Mary's response of faith to this announcement. Starting with verse 34, Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I'm a virgin? 
the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, that's a response of faith, Behold, the bondservant of the Lord may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, no one can accuse Mary here of anything like blind faith. We quite often hear this phrase, you're fanatics, you have this blind faith, you're crazy, you're just not reasonable enough, all those Bible-believing Christians. No, Mary's faith was not blind. She does not say here, well, how lovely, an angel of the Lord is speaking to me. Mary uses her brain, her intellect. It was a good and legitimate question from her her. How can this be? I'm a virgin. How can this be? How can, I, how can a child be conceived in my womb? So basically she's asking for additional information from God's angel. The priest Zechariah, father of John the Baptist, if you remember, had doubts. He lacked faith. Mary had genuine faith and trust in the Lord. God's answer is the incarnation. God will become a man. God and man at the same time. The divine miracle. We cannot and will never fully comprehend, maybe unless we get to heaven. This divine miracle. Verse 35. One more time. This verse. The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. The Holy Spirit will perform a great miracle so that Mary will become pregnant without having sexual relationship with a man. So, or therefore, in other English translations, indicates that Jesus' holiness comes from him being conceived by the Holy Spirit. He did not inherit a sinful nature from Adam. 1 John 3, 5 says, But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. 1 Peter 2.22 says, He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. Verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. Miracle? Not for God. He can do everything, for He is God. The bottom line here is that if God was able to create life in Eden, He can create life in a womb without a man involved. Remember how God created the universe out of nothing. He said, and it happened. Gabriel, angel Gabriel, gives Mary a sign. Her aged and infertile relative Elizabeth was pregnant. If God can do such a miracle for your relative Mary, for Elizabeth, what he promised, then he will be faithful to you, Mary, as well. Mary's obedience to God's will and God's choice in verse 38 is remarkable. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord may be done to me according to your word. What an example for all of us to follow. Let it be to me according to your word. And by the way, according to the Old Testament laws and prescriptions, if a girl was found, was caught in the act of fornication, adultery, what was the punishment for such misbehavior? Does anybody remember? According to the law of Moses, what was it? Stoning. Her reputation in that small community was at risk. Her life, her life was at risk. But nevertheless, 
she said the following words, Behold, the bond servant of the Lord may be done to me according to your word. Mary submits to God and his will and trusts the Lord despite fears and reservations. In those days, she, as we all have heard, she could have been stoned according to the law of Moses. She could lose her engagement and Joseph might just break up and leave her. She could lose her reputation in the community. Nevertheless, Mary said, may your word to me be fulfilled. Amazing faith, incredible, strong, mature faith for a young Hebrew girl. So what can we conclude? What can be applied from this text to us living almost in 2024? Conclusion number one, God never forgets his promises to people. Never. If you're the Bible reader, if you're a committed, devoted Bible reader, you spend your time studying God's Word, you will discover that God always keeps His Word. Two, God is the author of our salvation through Jesus Christ. He initiated the salvation. And unless God comes and reveals himself to us, as he did to Mary through Gabriel, we would never be able to find him. So whenever we say, whenever somebody says, I believed in Jesus Christ, we can say, yeah, partially it's a true statement. But we are saved by God's grace, not by what we have done, but by what God has done. Three. Mary is not the source of blessing. God gave her his grace to become a mother of Messiah. Tragically, we're living in, in the world where millions and millions and millions of people believe that Mary is a worthy object of worship. And they believe that Mary is the source of grace. They pray to Mary. They hold that she will be interceding before Heavenly Father on their behalf. Try to find it in the Bible, where it is justified in the biblical text, such a misconception. Mary is not the source of blessing. God gave her his grace to become a mother of Messiah. Four, there is nothing impossible for God. He is Almighty. He is El Shaddai. He can do everything. Five, that was the only way to save people from sin and eternal destruction. People need a savior. The ultimate perfect sacrifice was to be made to please the wrath of holy God. That was the only way. Six, incarnation is not a myth. It really happened nearly 2,000 years ago. Seven, follow Mary's obedience and fulfill God's will in your lives. Mary submits and trusts the Lord despite the fears and reservations. Christian faith is not a negotiation, but surrender, full surrender to God's will. When we say to God, let your will be done, when we follow the example of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember how he was praying, but in the final, the final statement of his prayer to the Heavenly Father, but let not mine, but your will be done. Eighth point, the virgin birth of Christ is undoubtedly the most essential doctrine underlying, underlying his deity that he is God, he is fully God, who came to this earth, who took upon himself a human flesh, who lived in this life, who walked in Israel for 33 years, who knows what it feels to be a human being, who was in our shoes, who experienced and hunger and famine and tiredness and exhaustion. He was in our situation. And before the prayer, there's a short but powerful verse recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, which says, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. 
Being human beings, we're set up in this way in our sinful fallen flesh. We want to see, we want to hear, we want to touch before we trust and believe. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. We're called to believe. We're called to see with the eyes of faith. Let us pray and give God the glory. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for keeping your word, for remembering your promises to Israel, to humanity, about the coming of the Messiah. For 400 years, you did not send any prophecy, any prophet to Israel. And people living in Israel, Palestine, they were thinking, what's going on? Did God forget about us? Did God ab forget about his promises to patriarchs of our nation? No, he didn't. God always keeps his word. And Lord, thank you for the faithful response of Mary. What a lesson. What an example for all of us to follow. Such an incredible faith. So it doesn't matter whether you're young, too young, or adult, or in well-advanced years. You can have a strong faith by God's grace, by God's mercy. So Lord, if we're lacking faith in the days we're living in, strengthen our faith, please, and teach us how to pray, how to trust you fully with, with everything, with all things that are going in our lives. Help us to see you with the eyes of faith, like Mary did, like many Bible characters, those men and women of faith. Lord, thank you for this passage, for the news of the Christmas Advent season. It is all about you. It is all about your love, grace, and mercy. And it is a reminder for us that you came to this world to die for our sins, for all our sins. And Lord, we're so thankful to you that your grace is bigger than all our sin. That's what we ask and pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. Praises be to God. So for benediction from Jude, the first and the last chapter of Jude, verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless, with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. God bless you all. Come back next uh, Sunday, twice next Sunday, for the morning service and candlelight service. Well, God bless you and have a, have a blessed week.